we asked ourselves, what if we lined up some of the world's top minds in science, astronomy, technology, academia, and futurism, and got them to ponder some of the most popular what-ifs? This is What If Discussed. Here are Teddy Wilson and Richard Garner. Welcome to What If Discussed, specifically the beginning of What If Discussed, our first ever episode. I'm Teddy Wilson. And I'm Richard Garner. Today's episode and question is, what if we lived in a galactic zoo? Richard, have you pondered this question in your life a lot? Today? <laughs> Today we're going to ponder the heck out of it. Um, I've pondered it. I, it to be honest, the, the, the first time I saw... The uh, the what if video? What if we uh, lived in a galactic zoo? I had not ever put those two words together: galactic and zoo. You'd not. So so I had not pondered living in a galactic zoo. Ooh, I had. But however, I'd pondered the idea of it. The, you know, I mean, we've seen it a lot in in, in a whole bunch of different sci-fi treatments about yeah. this idea that we're either in a maze or an experiment or in a zoo or whatever it is, not knowingly. And then of course, there's somebody sort of Truman Show style on the other side of that, watching us or observing us. So, but the interesting thing about the zoo part is it it implies that, right? It implies a few things that we know from animal zoos. It means we sort of went out and hunted some, I don't know, creatures, species, caged them, put them into some facility so we could kind of, a, scientifically observe them, but B, from a society standpoint, just go and get, you know, eat some popcorn and, and watch the gorillas and the zebras. And if that's the case, and if we're in a quote-unquote galactic zoo, obviously in this analogy, we're the zebras and we're the apes. And I don't know how well that sits with most people. Right, yeah. It's certainly humbling. Yes, it it's is. certainly humbling. It should be humbling. Well, it's yeah. interesting because to me the notion of you know, could we be in a galactic zoo or that question rather is has a couple different prongs. One of those prongs or one of the possibilities could be that we were actively put in the zoo, put in some sort of uh, pen or cage, that cage, of course, being Earth or maybe being our solar system or maybe being the Milky Way galaxy. Who knows? But that's one possibility. Another possibility is less that we're, we were put in this position or in this reality by an alien race, by some sort of super being. And rather, we are being observed by an alien race or a super being, but we weren't necessarily put here. And that, that kind of lesser idea that we are just being observed, as animals in a zoo are, uh, goes way back in science fiction. So does the notion that we were put here. But for me, I was first attracted to this idea and first started to really contemplate this idea that we could be being watched, specifically by aliens. I was first turned on to that by Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End. Of course, Arthur C. Clarke, one of the great sci-fi authors of all time. You'd mention him in the same uh, breath as Isaac Asimov or um, Ray Bradbury, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, and of course others. Um, and Childhood's End posits the question, what if we were being watched and what if that alien race one day revealed itself to us? In Childhood's End, I won't get into spoilers, but the alien race reveals themselves when we're on the verge of space flight. That's a very similar plot point that we saw in Star Trek. Trek First Contact, where aliens, in that case it was Vulcans, revealed themselves the first time we used warp drive. So there's usually something that prompts our galactic zookeepers to reveal themselves, and sometimes it turns out well, sometimes it doesn't. But certainly it's a well-worn trope within sci-fi, and I've actually been thinking about this question since I was a teenager, and I find it endlessly intriguing. And, and I do too, in terms of the, like, again, the zoo thing, not so much. I hadn't necessarily thought of it from that, because again, there's there's a there's another level of implication of what being in the zoo uh, from our experience here on Earth uh, implies. But the idea of being observed, uh, let's say this is what I would have used. I would have used the word experiment, oh. right? For me, that, that's been something I've thought about for, for a long time, and again, Partially because you're you're kind of steered towards that through some of the great sci-fi and, and literature that you do read or watch growing up. Of course, movies like The Matrix was a you know for a lot of people was like a massive awakening to even the idea of and you know that gets into a whole bunch of other areas. But just the overall idea that you know and you use the word humbling when you get outside of the idea that we are at the you know a we're all that there is. B that we human beings are. With undoubtedly at the top of the food chain, mm -hmm. 
And then you start to, to postulate the ideas of both those things not being the case. Well, it, it changes your entire perspective on things. And that obviously brings into what you were talking about. Is it aliens? Is it super beings? Is it us? from the future watching our you know what i mean is it, it a god whatever is it a form god that and, that, and, and that's probably as old as the question of god yeah yeah well i mean i mentioned a few examples of this being tackled in fiction south park also kind of addressed it in a 2002 episode called cancelled it's been represented in video games will wright who of course famously um created the sims and sim city did a very well-loved video game called spore which kind of looked at this question as well so it's well represented in fiction and it's also well re represented in terms of real world thinkers and we're going to have one of them on the show later and he is probably one of the only people on earth who could say that they have an informed opinion on on this matter because he's been at the top of the pyramid in the search for alien intelligence for decades. Douglas Vakoch will be joining us later in the show, but first let's take a closer look at what if we lived in a galactic zoo. Imagine being trapped in a zoo. Well, if we really do live in a galactic zoo, then you'd already be in one. Aliens could be out there watching your every move. They may want to study the human race or learn from our technology. Or maybe they're planning to attack us. But are we sure that intelligent life is even out there? Well, the odds are pretty good. The existence of alien life could be explained by the Fermi paradox. We have our sun, but in the universe there are billions of other suns. And they're billions of years older than our solar system. Orbiting these other suns could be Earth-like planets. And on Earth-like planets, there's a good chance of there being highly intelligent life. With so many worlds out there, there's an even better chance that at least one of them has developed interstellar travel. The Fermi paradox suggests that with interstellar travel, it would take a few million years to travel through the entire Milky Way galaxy. You may think that sounds like an incredibly long time, but if there's a civilization that is billions of years older than us, it would just be a tiny fraction of their history. So if all this is true, which is very likely, the aliens may have already found us. And apart from us being a pretty violent species, we may not be interesting enough for them to make contact with us. We may just be another life form out of the thousands or millions that the aliens have seen. After all, if you see an ant colony on the ground, do you try to make contact with it? You most likely go along with your day. To other life forms out there, we may just be a simple group of ants. Ants they don't want to hurt or bother. Just observe. Another thing we have to keep in mind is how we communicate with the aliens. Ants in our world might be trying to communicate with us, but unless they send the right signals, we'll never know. The same goes for the aliens and us we may not be communicating with the aliens the right way. They may not even know that we want to make contact with them, so they just leave us alone. What is the best way to communicate with aliens? We'll leave that story for another What If. Well, to paraphrase a well-worn trope, I, for one, welcome our new alien overlords. <laughs> and to talk with Richard and I about whether he would, too, is Jay Moon, senior researcher with the What If team. Jay, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. When you're not busy sucking up if to, you will. to, to yeah. the alien overlords. Uh, yeah. The old Ken yeah. Brockman. Eh? My sycophancy <laughs> is all I have. Yeah. Um, so why did this come up as a, uh, as a, as a What If video idea? Well, you know, it's it's trying to sort of expand on that idea or try to get people to think outside of the box that everything about this universe is about humans. We always use us as the barometer. Let's measure everything out there against our accomplishments. Right. So, but we wanted to put a spin on that and sort of put the question out there, well, what if we're somebody's hiccup? What what if we're the kind of the stench they can't quite get out of the room? So they've just sort of set it off to the side and we're just kind of spinning around doing our thing. Well, it speaks to like, I mean, the one thing about the zoo analogy, it's just quite powerful. I mean, it's be hard to find a, a person that's never been to a zoo or doesn't know what a zoo is. And there's a couple of things that are implied from that, right? I, I mean, a zoo in the end is us who are better or let's say the highest on the food chain, going to look at 
and uh, amuse ourselves, let's say, with the lesser species, right? Yes. And, yes. And, they're, and they're caged and they're, you know, they have some free dumb, but they're not free. If we extrapolate that concept and apply it to this, there's a lot of people who would be like, wait a sec, that, that's a terrifying thought because that definitely puts us lower on the food chain, if you will, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. other species out there. How does the idea for you guys putting this together um, address that idea that, you know, we're just, I don't want to say sheep and, you know, animals, but in that, in that scenario, we are, mm -hmm. if we're in a galactic zoo. You know, if that's the case, because I mean, if you look at it by the numbers, we still have explored less than, or we know about even 0% of what's out there. So not 1%, we're, not 2%. We're not even... We're not even at, we're at we're, zero. Yeah, yeah, we're not even a blink on, on, on that chart for, for what's out there. So it's that idea, it's like, okay, there certainly must be something out there that's kind of checking in on us. But what would we do if we knew it was happening? What would we do if some people thought it was happening and others didn't fall in line with that train of thought? And what, we'd, what would we need for the proof? How do we prove somebody is watching us? If we did actually know that that was going on, what does that do to society in general? Right. You know, just... Does society change? Does religion get thrown out the window? If we think there's somebody up there looking at us, do we up the efforts to try and reach out to them? Mm -hmm. Do we start to even look at ourselves inwards and wonder why they're not trying to contact us? Yeah. What are we doing wrong that they want to avoid us? Well, and it's interesting because, I mean, that is kind of the basis of religion is that there we there is somebody watching. Whether the watchers are the creators. The watchers are the creators, going back to whether it's on Mount Olympus or... Uh, in heaven or whatever you but let's try this from another perspective because we we often either default to one of those two possibilities the god concept or the alien concept but a third possibility here could be a la westworld for instance right and it, i love if you if you watch westworld and it's not a spoiler to say that they're literally standing over a miniature version of the park and watching their children creations. Their, their creations operate and obviously intervening when necessary etc and it to me it's a really strong visual of the idea of the galactic zoo what if that's the case what if it's what if we are ai and they whoever created us is watching us from a from a different perspective so we've sort of taken the singularity and jumped it into space you know so they're so they're coming down with that well, then, then you start to get into, if we are the, the AI, well, good for us. Look how much we've accomplished as just, as just the AI. I feel like if I was in space watching humanity, I'd be freaked out by a lot of what we do. Or, and <laughs> entertained. Or entertained. Right. A lot of it depends on the soundtrack. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. Good soundtrack can make all the difference. Jay, thanks so much for being here. And after the break, uh, we're going to be joined by someone we're very, very lucky to have on the podcast, Douglas Vakoch, who is one of Earth's leading figures in our search for extraterrestrials who may or may not also be our galactic zookeepers. That's coming up. Since his time in high school back in rural Minnesota, Douglas Vakoch has attempted to communicate with interstellar beings. As an American astrobiologist, researcher, and psychologist, he spent some time at SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, specifically working on interstellar message composition. Now, as founder and president of METI, Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence, he continues his quest, along with other scientists and astrobiologists, to communicate with interstellar life. Welcome back to What If Discussed. Today's question, what if we're living in a galactic zoo? And joining us to discuss further is astrobiologist, SETI researcher, and founder of the organization METI, or Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence, Douglas Vakoch. Hello there, how are you? Very well, thanks. Glad to join you today. Well, we're really glad that you've joined us, and um, you are an amazing guest to be talking to about about this subject. We've got a lot to dive into with you, but right off the top, um, let's pose that question to you because this is your life's work. So, what if we were living in a galactic zoo? Well, you know, if we're living in a galactic zoo, it could seem pretty quiet. I mean, imagine 
uh, you and I went out to the zoo and we're looking at a bunch of animals, we might, we would know they're there. Uh, and, you know, they would be looking at us and know we're here, but there wouldn't be a lot of conversation going on. You know, if we're looking at a bunch of zebras and they're just talking to one another and kind of doing their zebra thing, we would tend to move on to the gazelles. Uh, but what we really are wondering when we ask that question about the galactic zoo, if there's anything about that scenario that we could tweak a little bit that could actually lead to um, interspecies communication. Because that's the whole goal of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which has been going on for over half century. And the more recent project, METI, Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence, where we actively send messages of our own trying to make contact. So I would, I would say the most obvious follow-up question, and this is just maybe my personal opinion, that if we were to conclude that we are living in a galactic zoo, my next question would be, who are the zoo keepers? And I'm sure that would come up a lot in your work. How would you answer that question? The civilizations that we want to make contact with are civilizations that have been around a long, long time. We humans have had radio technology for about a century. But if that's the norm across the universe, then we're not going to be around at the same time as another civilization. So our uh, universe has existed for a bit over 13 billion years. In a universe that old, if two civilizations each last 100 years, one pops up at one point, one pops up at another point, what's the likelihood they're going to overlap in the course of that 13 billion years? It's virtually zero. So the only way we'll make contact is if the other civilization is much older than we are. Uh, and so in that case, they would be like the galactic zookeeper, the ones who have been around, perhaps they have been observing us, uh, but they're simply out there listening and, and, and observing us, almost like we observe animals in a zoo. And so at first, glance that seems like it's a pretty pessimistic scenario for us making contact if they already know we're here if they're already watching us then it, and they've decided not to be sending us messages because we've been looking at a lot of stars then it, it sounds like we're in this zoo where we're the caged animals and they're observing from afar but that's it and we can never know that they're there but again, let's imagine that we all go to a zoo and we're like the galactic zookeepers, we're the zookeepers. But all of a sudden, instead of that zebra just looking around and you know chumming around with other zebras, it turns toward us, looks us straight in the eye and starts pounding out a series of numbers with its hoof. I mean, that would establish a radically different relationship between us and the zebra and you can bet I'm not gonna go down and check out the hyenas at this point. I'm gonna really try to establish some relationship and really understand better what in the world is going on in the mind of this zebra that it's no longer content just to be in its own environment, but it's reaching out to me. And so that's the hope of METI, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence, that instead of just passively waiting for the signals to come in, we reach out to them to let them know we want to make first contact. And it, you know, it may be that some civilizations out there are sending us signals, we just haven't come across them yet, but at least for some civilizations, maybe they require us to take the initiative. So in a sense, adding METI to the mix of strategies is growing up as a, an interstellar civilization that we're adding another way that we might make contact for any civilizations out there that are looking at us like animals in a galactic zoo. But animals that, if they start speaking back, might be interesting enough to engage in conversation. That, that's a really interesting way to, to frame the question. And so let's assume we are the animals in a, in a galactic zoo and there is an, another type of being watching us and observing us. 
Let's talk about making contact because I, I know you say that time scale is the, the biggest obstacle in terms of sending and receiving an apply, a reply. You said before that uh, in a best case scenario, it takes around four to five years for a message to get there and get back. And that's, clo- that's assuming that we're uh, messaging potential alien life in a very close star system. Um, but let's say we can get that message out there. I know that you've said uh, previously that Trappist-1 is one of your favorite targets for you and your colleagues at Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Tell us a little bit about Trappist-1 and why you think it could be the home of our galactic zookeepers. Well, Trappist is a wonderful star system. Uh, and first of all, it is close on a galactic scale. Remember, our our uh, Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. So it takes 100,000 years from light to go uh, from one end of the galaxy to the other. So that's a, a incredibly big distance. On that galactic scale, Trappist is right in our own backyard. It's only 40 light years away. Uh, but within this single star system, uh, there are at least seven planets and three of them are at just the right distance from the star to be potentially habitable. And so when we try to determine whether a planet that's orbiting another star is habitable, we look at how far away from the star it is and what it's made up of. Is it a rocky sort of planet like the Earth or is it more of a gaseous planet like Jupiter or Saturn? And so there are three planets orbiting Trappist-1 that are rocky sorts of planets like our Earth, so they would have the kind of of chemicals, uh, kind of elements that would be necessary to support uh, uh, complex biologies. But just as importantly, um, they are not so close to the star that they're going to be scorched by the fire of the star. They're not so far out away from that star that they're going to be frozen, but they're in what we call the Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot, not too cold, but just right to support liquid water. So uh, again, sort of taking this, let's say to the next level, there's plenty of fiction, movies, et cetera, where the concept of, of humanity living in a world that they believe is quote unquote real and ultimately discovering you know, whether you take something like the Maze Hunter or even the Truman Show or whatever it is, that there's actually somebody watching, observing. And and again, you would take that as somebody who's watching and observing for a reason. The, an ex- ma- an the ex- Matrix. The Matrix, you know, the, an experiment, if you will. But what you can also sort of extrapolate from that idea, potentially, is that the watcher is also the creator. And that doesn't necessarily mean the, mean it that it is the case, but I've, I've got to believe that that's come up before when people are talking about the galactic zoo concept that, in fact, uh, if somebody is watching it, that they were more more than likely part of our prehistory. How do you, where do you fall on that? Well, it, that certainly makes sense when you think about the zoos that we have created here on Earth. So it intuitively makes sense. The big difference, though, when we are talking about the possibility of being on a galactic scale zoo is that it really does take a, quite a bit of energy to travel between the stars. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, but it's certainly a lot easier to communicate um, with radio and laser signals. They can We can send signals at interstellar distances very rapidly, very cheaply, as compared to it being a a pretty onerous process to travel between the stars. And really, if they have already come here, uh, well, we certainly haven't seen evidence. There are some people who think UFOs are evidence of, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena or evidence of aliens. I haven't seen anything that's convinced me. I mean, no one's brought me any, any material object that has not been already created here on Earth. So I, I, I don't see credibility in the claims that the aliens have already come here. So it's, it's certainly, I guess, a possibility that Earth could have been seeded from life in space. I mean, it, it is a, 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 an element of a lot of science fiction stories where, you know, the aliens came here, seeded Earth, and now they'll, they'll go away for a number of years and, and see what has developed. Uh, but 
typically it's it's a, an interesting mindset within the SETI and METI communities that we attempt to be really quite open-minded about new possibilities, always exploring alternative ways of making contact, but also as much as we can be grounded in the constraints of, of science uh, as we know them right now. So, you know, I, I, I can't rule out the possibility uh, that if there are galactic zookeepers that, you know, they, they populated our world. All I would say is that if they did it, it seems like they went back pretty early in the process because what evolutionary biology has shown us is that there is a is clear evidence of the complexification and diversification of life from the most primordial life single-celled life over three billion years ago so there's no evidence of any sort of interventional um, so if the alien seeded life, it had to be pretty early on. So here's a curveball of a question, though, though I think on, on this topic, most questions are, are curveballs and obviously very speculative and hypothetical. Mm -hmm. But if we are in a galactic zoo and the watchers have ability to make contact with us, but they've not yet made contact, they've chosen to not yet make contact, what do you think could prompt them to make contact? W one of my favorite depictions of this idea in science fiction is from the film Star Trek First Contact. And in that film, uh, a, a character named Dr. Zephram Cochran invents warp drive, uses warp drive on Earth for the first time. And that is the impetus for aliens, in this case, I believe it's, um, it's Vulcans, to make contact with Earthlings, to make first contact. So what do you think could prompt our galactic zookeepers to make contact if they're out there and watching us? Well, following up that Star Trek universe first contact scenarios, uh, one reason that it's okay to break the prime directive, so the prime directive is don't interfere with a, a less technologically advanced civilization unless, and then unless what? Unless they already have warp drive, in which case are they're on the verge of going out uh, into the universe and exploring. But we've also seen a number of cases uh, in other episodes, especially in the original series with Kirk kind of violating the, the prime directive frequently. Um, yes. The idea that, that maybe this is a civilization on the brink of its annihilation and providing a little bit of information could help avoid that. Now, again, some strict definition of the prime directive. I, I don't know that you're going to get everyone at, at the Federation to agree that it's appropriate to break the prime directive. but. There are individual starship captains that will do that. Uh, and, and so I think it depends too how you would interpret that sense of um, when do you let another civilization know um, that there is life out there if you're the galactic zookeeper. I have to say my, my real fear, my, my, when I, the thing that keeps me up at night, that gives me nightmares, is that the aliens in fact are like hyper-intelligent cats, just like my own cat. I mean, he knows that I'm here. He really just doesn't care. <laughs> and, and, and so in that case, the question is, what could I possibly do that would intrigue him enough, get him interested enough in uh, something like me that's not that interesting in his world? And similarly for the galactic zookeepers, well, we're just, you know, other animals in a zoo. What's interesting enough to prompt a reply? So like with my cat, it's the question is, What's the analog of an interstellar yarn? Something intriguing enough to make them want to know a little bit more. And I think sometimes it's really intimidating to imagine contact with the siblings maybe a million years more advanced. I mean, what do we have to teach them? If they are really the masters of this galactic zoo, they know science a million years beyond our science, what do we have to teach them. And I think the key then is to really put ourselves in the proper perspective and ask, what is it that a civilization so young on a galactic scale could teach someone so old? And so our natural emphasis when we meet a stranger is to show how strong and wise and powerful we are. Admittedly, we're not going to be any of those things compared to a million year old civilization. Maybe instead we should emphasize just the opposite. What perspective can we bring as a civilization that 
really is uncertain about our future. Are we going to survive global warming? Are we going to survive the threat of nuclear war? How do we as individuals get through our lives knowing that someday inevitably we're going to die? So I think it's these these fears, these insecurities related to our own finitude that may actually be the most interesting things, things that a civilization far in advance of us may have really forgotten. I mean, if they're stable enough to have been searching for a million years, they're likely going to continue to exist another million years. But for us, that's not at all the case. And so I think what we can really teach them is almost it's a it's a chance to let them remember their own history, a history they've long since forgotten, but now that they can see living itself in front of them through us. That is, that is a deeply interesting way to way, way to put it. Like they're looking into the past. Yeah. That, that I is... think so. I think so. And, and, you know, I think that's the big thing that we really have to gain. You know, there, there's some who would say, oh, it's dangerous to transmit to the aliens. They're going to come to Earth and annihilate us. Or, you know, maybe they will send us all of the secrets uh, to uh, overcoming all of the conflicts we have here on Earth. I, I think when we imagine aliens, it's natural to project our our greatest fears and our deepest desires out there. Realistically, I don't think we'll get either of those. But maybe what we most get is a chance to hold a mirror up to ourselves. And so in the same way, I think we can hold a mirror up to the aliens. Well, Douglas, I'm, I'm pretty sure I speak for both Richard and I when I say that if aliens, if our watchers in this galactic zoo are akin to hyper-intelligent cats, I hope they don't treat us like a ball of string or yarn and just <laughs> bat us around the living room of the universe. <laughs> the, the, that's right. That's right. But the trick is maybe we can tie something onto the end of that, but put something in the middle of that ball of yarn that will at least bring the connection back to us. I see a meme developing. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Douglas, thank you so much for, for chatting with us. This has been really, 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 really fascinating as a discussion. We appreciate your time. And wanted to ask you, how should people find you and uh, Medi messaging extraterrestrial intelligence online if they want to read more about what you and your colleagues do? Just come to our website, www.meti.org. Douglas Vakach, thanks for joining us. Take care. More of What If Discussed, coming up after this. Hey everyone, Richard here. We are having so much fun making the show for you. We wanted to find the most knowledgeable experts and people to interview for this podcast. We hope you're enjoying it so far. We're currently creating the next season of What If Discussed, and we'd really appreciate your help. If you like what we do here, support us on Patreon. By contributing to our show, you will get exclusive access to our behind-the-scenes episodes, you'll get your what-if questions answered, and you'll receive a personal voice message. Head over to our show notes and sign up to become part of our Patreon community. This is What If Discussed. Here are Richard Garner and Teddy Wilson. Again, another fascinating discussion, as you would, I guess, hope to expect uh, when you're tuning into an episode of What If Discussed, but especially when that, that episode is called what if we are living in a galactic zoo and you have again arguably the most knowledgeable person about this subject matter on the earth or in the area code is on the short list that's on the for short sure. list is, yep. is somebody like douglas vakoch and if you haven't had a chance by the way and maybe we'll uh we'll send some links out on the facebook uh or in the what if discuss group but there's a lot of great ted talks that he's done on this subject matter and actually most of our guests have those types of things but he's a really fascinating dude i mean one of the first things that i took away from that is just again somebody that's been at this for a long time um who is so passionate about the uh, the you know the search the exploration um that sounds like somebody who he could he could be teaching a grade seven chemistry class and addressing NASA, right? Like he's, he, he's somebody that's very accessible in a lot of ways, but very, very passionate about the idea of uh, us being essentially animals in a, in a galactic zoo, not willing to necessarily make absolute conclusions one way or the other, but was a pretty open-minded and, and cool guest for lack of a better way to say it. 
Yeah, and I mean, I, I was really intrigued by his talking about the difference between METI, Messaging Extraterrestrial mm. Intelligence, and of course the organization that more people probably know of and have, have preconceived notions of, and that is SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I found his kind of uh, discussion of the difference between those two very mm. interesting. He also brought up some ideas that I haven't up to this point thought of, and specifically he talked about you know what could a what could an advanced alien civilization tens of thousands hundreds of thousands millions of years ahead of us in terms of evolution learn from us and he i was very um interested in the way he talked about our vulnerability or our fear of death and that aliens could learn from that and then it would almost be novel to them mm -hmm. i'd never thought about it in those terms i've only thought about it to be honest in the in terms of benevolent or malevolent yes. are they coming to help us or even just to observe us or are they coming to kill us but he put some different um he put some different angles on that on that kind of notion and i really like that and that's and it, it, like almost like we're more a curiosity yeah right? like almost like a, well the cat example cat just doesn't care the only reason you're bringing up a cat in this context is to demonstrate aloofness Right, right, right. Like basically, man, I don't care one way or the other. Are you feeding me or not? Yeah. Like, and and it was interesting because he, he referenced his cat. But in that regard, some people, and because Medi, and I don't know this, I apologize. I, I'll, I'll Google this later. But I would assume, because Medi is a relatively newer organization uh, versus SETI, which, as we know, has been around for a few decades now. And Medi, again, was kind of, SETI 2.0. Well, wait a sec. We've been l l listening for X amount of decades. Perhaps maybe we should be sending a message instead. Or in parallel with listening, we should always al also be sending a message. Douglas Vakoch's logic for that is to almost let a super advanced species know that, hey, hey, we're here. Like where is zebra example that if, if we were walking by zebras in a zoo and a zebra turn around and start talking to you, you would be like, hey, everybody, stop. We got to get these zebras out of here. They're conscious beings like more than we thought. Right. And his 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 logic is that's kind of why we'd be doing the Medi uh, sort of methodology. But I assume that's also when um, Stephen Hawking came out with sounding the alarm around the idea of sending messages out his his position on what that was that's a bad idea because if we send a message out to somebody who doesn't know and they are malevolent and they and it's like hey thanks for helping us we were looking for somebody to conquer and you just basically said hey here we are i personally don't believe that but you know somebody like hawking of, of hawking's sort of intelligence in the scene you got to you got to respect it, I guess. And, and I mean, the other thing is, you know, we think in terms of uh, us being not as advanced and our potential galactic zookeepers or watchers being more advanced. But it could also be that, um, you know, we're sending a message that they can't properly interpret. It's not just about whether or not they're more advanced than us. It has to do with whether they speak our, the types of language that we're sending out. You know, the Voyager space probes obviously famously include the golden record, right? Which has information about Earth and about us as a human species. But just because uh, a receiving alien life form is more advanced than us doesn't mean that they would properly interpret that message, you know? They might not be able to interpret it because they're so far advanced that they've forgotten how to communicate in the way that we do currently. Or there are, there are any sort of um, number of, uh, of options or of, of eventualities, right? Um, but I'm intrigued by that, you know, that we're already sending messages out and that Medi is obviously furthering that. I also thought it was interesting talking to him about TRAPPIST-1, and I asked him about that star system in particular because in the last few years, it's the Alpha Centauri system that's really grasped a lot of the headlines in terms of people like us who are curious about the search for extraterrestrial life. And that is because Alpha Centauri is the closest star to us. And it's also where they've recently discovered the planet Proxima B, which they say is the most Earth-like uh, planet that we have found as an exoplanet up to this point. So I wanted to ask him about that one in particular because I had heard him speak about it in previous interviews. And I, I liked what he had to say about TRAPPIST-1. And it seems that that should certainly be a focus of our of our search for, um, for extraterrestrial life. It's interesting because he also said, and it's not something we're, we're not aware of, but when somebody repeats and reminds you of the fact that, yes, we've only, like how young we are, right? 
he the, says the radio frequency thing for a hundred years. Yeah. Now here you're talking about Trappist uh, one and all these other galaxies that we've obviously discovered in a very short period of time through an incredible advancement in technology of telescopes of of everything else and yet as we're as we're searching the stars and talking about different galaxies and all these things we're babies yeah like we're little infants probably relative to what other species would be in a gal in a universe of 14 billion so years and that's always the other thing that we need to probably be reminded of that this we're just beginning this search right like it really is, uh, but it's it's happening faster and faster and faster. If if a hundred years ago we didn't have radio signals, and now we're talking about you know stuff like the the, the Webb telescope going out there that can see and I don't know what. Yeah, the James this, Webb telescope. The James Webb telescope. This is this is happening uh, at an exponential rate. We talk about the exponential rate of technology increase and change. Moore's but, law. But in Moore's law. In this particular context, this search is 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 on fast forward. Yeah, well, I'm I'm certainly endlessly intrigued by the the possibility of living in a galactic zoo. I just hope our zookeepers, our watchers, are of the benevolent variety. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have put it better myself. Thank you so much for being a part of this episode and for joining us. And we'll catch you on the next What If Discussed. <laughs>